Good morning, everyone. Good morning, good morning, and welcome back. Welcome back to the Porsche Cool Podcast. It's Tuesday, and you know what Tuesday means. Tuesday is owner stories. Uh, today, I'm going to just do a little short intro because I'm running a little bit late, and I'm got, uh, I've got Bob joining me very shortly, like in a couple of minutes, actually. Um, and Bob is... Uh, Bob lives... I think Bob told me he lives in two places. We'll check with him when he comes online, but he lives in uh, Alberta, which is in Canada, I guess. And he also lives in Texas. Um, he's got a good story. You know the car he owns. It's in the title. I won't mention it yet. Let's let's get into the story with Bob. Uh, but it's a good one because we haven't had... Uh, I haven't had an owner on the owner's stories with this model year of GT3. So I'm pretty excited about it. So with without any more sort of banter or rambling on on my part, let's get Bob on the line and let's start talking about his Porsche Cooled owner's story. Okay, welcome back, everyone. Uh, welcome back to the Porsche Cooled podcast. Like I said, this is owner's stories. Um, I was running a little bit late today. I thought I was going to be late, but Bob is here and Bob is joining us. Uh, Bob is from in Texas at the moment, aren't you, Bob? Is that where you that, are at the moment? That's correct, in Houston. In Houston. So Bob is joining us from Houston. He also uh, lives in uh, Canada, in uh, Alberta, correct? That's correct, in Calgary, Alberta. In Calgary, Alberta. So uh, Bob's Bob's a bit of a jet setter between uh, <laughs> between Canada and the US. I don't know how that's how's that working out for you with COVID, Bob. It must be uh, a little bit scary because, as you know, I've just flown from Bahrain not long ago into London. Um, so you know, we had to quarantine and things like that. Is there quarantining happening between USA and Canada? Uh, in Canada, there is, um, and there was early on uh, with, with COVID in the states. But uh, yeah, I've had uh, twenty-seven different airline flights between uh, Calgary and Houston during COVID. It's been quite the experience. But uh, if you use the safeguards, the masks and the, the hand sanitizer, and keep your distance as much as you can, um, I've proven you can do it safely. Yeah, it's a weird, um, you know, I I've have, you know, I used to travel four times a year backwards and forwards from London or Bahrain to Sydney, um, four to five times a year, I guess. But it, it's quite weird flying now as well because of the fact that there's just no one in the airports. I don't mm-hmm. know how the US is, but in, you know, Bahrain and even coming into London, it's a really weird situation, uh, a weird feeling how it's just so deserted. Yeah, it was, uh, especially the early flights in uh, at the Calgary airport, um, which I had in... Uh, late March of last year uh, during the lockdown, um, it was spooky uh, yeah, when you're yeah. walking through those airports. Yeah. yeah, it is definitely. All right, let's get into the Porsche story because I think the listeners are going to enjoy this one today. Uh, and like I said in the intro, um, we haven't had, I haven't had anyone, any owner on the owner story that has had a, a, a GTT, a GT3, sorry, of, of the year that you have. So I think that's going to be interesting. And I know we, we spoke before, this is not your first Porsche. So let's go back to the very beginning, Bob, uh, where I always like to start the podcast. And that is, what are your first memories of of Porsche or 911? Um, Did you have any family that used to own own the car when you were a kid? Was it neighbors? Did you just see them in your neighborhood? Was it something that you started thinking, hey, I want one of those uh, earlier in life or later in life? It was probably a bit of both. Um, the first one I saw was back in 1978 in a doctor in my neighborhood. I lived, lived in a small town in uh, Atlantic Canada, so there was no Porsche dealership. Uh, there was only about 13,000 people in the town. Um, but a local doctor had purchased one, and it had the whale tail, um, and uh, it was a metallic brown. I, I forget the name of the, the, the proper name of the color. But it was just remarkable. Um, and I was about 18 years old at the time. Uh, I remember seeing it parked just down the street uh, from our house. And uh, it was wonderful. I, and I had always been into automobiles, uh, like many of us. That affliction uh, started early in life. And yes. uh, so it was the first time I, I saw one. And just the shape, um, it was so unique. I had seen them in magazines before, but to see to be able to walk up and I remember squeezing, probably shouldn't have done this, but I remember squeezing the foam on the or the rubber on the whale tail and it, it was just so different and unique. <laughs> it was it was pretty cool. Yeah. So that's where it all started. Yes. So when you so you see that car, you you, you start to, you know, you start to drive, you start to get your license. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What sort of cars do you it's interesting what people start with. What sort of car? What's the most <laughs> memorable car? I guess that you started with that you that you think would has led to this journey to end up with a Porsche. Um, 
Well, probably the most memorable was my uh, 325 IS, uh, BMW 325 IS, uh, which was a 91. Um, but my first car uh, was an AMC Pacer. And I don't okay. know if many of you understand that vehicle, but if any of you have seen the movie Wayne's World, All right. um, that <laughs> is the vehicle. It's been voted uh, by many car magazines and journalists as the worst automobile in the world. And, and that was my first. That was my your first, first car. My first car. But my first sports car, uh, semi-sports car, was that uh, 1991 uh, BMW 325 IS. And that's where I started to appreciate the engineering and the design, uh, the craftsmanship that go into go into sports cars, and then the, how much fun and joy that that, that, that that gives all of us. Well, that BMW is a good one to start with, actually, because that was a very good car, wasn't it? I mean, and, and now today, people are searching them out. They're searching yeah. out the Cabriolets, they're searching out the hardtops. I mean, it was a very, very good car when it came out. It was wonderful. And I remember I've always read car magazines and uh, uh, that f- uh, fueled the passion uh, when I couldn't afford uh, uh, something a bit nicer. And uh, uh, I remember reading in Automobile Magazine uh, a, a review of the 325 IS and the last uh, three sentences in that uh, magazine article was uh, buy this car, buy this car, buy this car. <laughs> and that's what, what, what really triggered me because I could hardly afford it. Um, right. I was early, early in my career. And, so you purchased uh, that new or you purchased that I, used? I purchased it. I purchased it new. I spec'd it, but uh, they didn't build it. They, I was living in New Orleans, Louisiana at the time. Right. And, uh, um, and so um, uh, actually a dealer um, in a city close to New Orleans, Baton Rouge, actually ended up having one. I had a tan interior and a, um, a green, uh, almost a British racing green exterior. Uh, and it was uh, a five speed. Um, Fantastic. And, uh, yeah, it was it was a wonderful car. I kept it for 12 years. I keep all my car. I try to keep all my cars for a long time. Um, it hasn't happened with the Porsches. But it, I wish I wish you probably wish you would have kept that 325i now yes, as well. Because uh, look, at, look at the prices of BMWs, M5s, yeah. 325i's, yeah. you know, the Cabriolets yeah. are having a resurgence, you know, yeah. all of those cars. And, and, and you know. Notably so, because they are such an iconic shape. You know, they're, they're a bit like the 911. Those early BMWs are such an iconic shape. So you can see the appeal of, of the BMW, of that era of 90s BMWs, that's for sure. Yeah. And it was bulletproof. It was very reliable. You know, the regular consumables needed to be taken care of. And what I found with, um, well, really any automobile, but certainly when I started buying, um, bought, bought my first uh, German automobile. Um, I spoke with some folks who had them, and, and they said, you know, just make sure you maintain them and 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 follow the the proper maintenance, and 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 they will, which can be a bit expensive, uh, um, but if you follow that uh, to the T, you really shouldn't have and take care of your automobile. You really shouldn't have any issues, and that was the success that I had. Yeah, I've heard that actually. The 90s BMWs were quite expensive to service and, and maintain, weren't they? They weren't a cheap car to maintain at the time. No, that's right. It was almost, there was no repairs. It was really replacements. You know, if there was a, a hole in your radiator, um, that, that in some manufacturers, they could repair that. But in with BMW, uh, you know, they would have to replace the whole, the whole radiator. And uh um, and I understand that certainly in high performance vehicles, you, you, you need to have that mindset. Um, yeah, yeah. But, uh, but yeah, that was my experience that if anything went, it was, it was replaced, but not very many things went. Yeah. That's good. So you had the AMC, you've got the, then you go into the BMW, <laughs> you go into the German car. Is that, yeah. is that the point where there's no turning back where the German cars are in your, are in your focal point? This is what you're going to look at from, in the coming years. So what, what is, what do you go into next? Is, does the Porsche come next or does that come later on? No, it comes a little bit later on. Uh, the, the next car, I had that for about uh, 10 or 12 years. And then in 2003, uh, BMW came out with their five speed five series, which was designed by Chris Bangle. And that was uh, yeah. a quite controversial design. Um, and and, and you know, the, the, there's the Bangle, but for the, for the seven series, but uh, 
Uh, you look at cars nowadays, in particular sedans, and you can see his influence on them. It's quite remarkable. But I ordered that car, and it was pretty bare bones. Okay. Um, I, again, I was stretching myself. I was living in Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada at the time. And uh, I was, uh, again, stretching what I could afford. So it was pretty a pretty uh, light spec. But it was a six-speed, and, uh, and it was the new design. And uh, I, really, uh, I really enjoyed it. So you like you like the manual cars. You 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 yeah. tend to buy manuals. You don't tend to yeah. buy the automatics. I mean, yeah. a lot of people, if they bought a five series, would choose the automatic at the mm -hmm. time. I think mm -hmm. it was probably a rare option to take the uh, to take the manual, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right. So you got the BMW. Do you keep that one for as long, the five series, for as long as the uh, three series? Um, I uh, no, I didn't. I uh, ended up. Uh, getting transferred, uh, as you can see, I'm a bit a bit of a nomad uh, with with my company, um, and uh, uh, so I, I got transferred to uh, uh, Milan, Italy, to do some work. And uh, so I, 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 I we didn't need two cars at the time, so uh, so I sold it. Um, and uh, my wife had a uh, BMW X5, so that was our vehicle while I was commuting back and forth between uh, Halifax and Milan. And, uh, uh, and, I, and and that was a great vehicle. The, the weather in um, Nova Scotia is uh, quite bad. The winters are, you get a lot of snow, a lot of freezing rain. It's right on the coast so that it never gets too cold, but you, you get slush and everything. So it's quite slippery. So uh, uh, an all wheel drive vehicle, robust, uh, with uh, with very good uh, snow tires is, is is what we needed, so so that's what we kept. Right, so it's practical, practical yeah. cars. Yeah. So let's jump forward. Is mm -hmm. there anything else we want to mention? Let's jump forward and let's talk about when the Porsche appeared, because I know everyone's waiting okay. for the the first Porsche story. Was there something else notable along the way before the Porsche came? No, we're we're right right up to me coming back from Milan and deciding. Okay, I've got to buy another vehicle, and what's that vehicle going to be? So there's lots and, of Porsches in Italy. You would have seen a few when you're in Milan for sure. Yes, they're absolutely. all around the place. Yes. So what happens? Let's let's start with the first one. Well, um, I was I was coming back. I was actually returning from Milan to Calgary, and. Uh, Again, uh, to, to another look, another location. Uh, but and uh, so I had to buy a vehicle, and um, the uh, um, I, I I wasn't sure what I wanted. I thought I might get a an, an M3. Um, I, I thought uh, I even looked at a Ford Mustang Bullet, uh, which okay. was a remarkable uh, automobile. Very, you know, I think it had like 350 horsepower and quite affordable. They're very affordable in North America, and. Uh, uh, and then I was um, on the internet just looking and, and, and there was a, a specialized dealer, not a Porsche dealer, but a, a specialized dealer, uh, independent dealer. And they had a 997.1 uh, Carrera 4S. Um, and I wasn't, cons I really wasn't considering Porsche at the time, um, but that intrigued me. And I remember when I was in, and I, you know, they knew they were a little bit expensive and I was always concerned about, you know, maintenance and things like that. And, and, uh, and then I remember seeing one in Milan and, and, and in, in, in the downtown parts of the, the city, there's tons of uh, cobblestone streets. And I remember seeing it. Uh, zooming down a cobblestone street uh, on it with a tram line, you know, the rails in there. And I was thinking these cars are built for it. Yeah. And, you know, and, and I had always heard that they were reliable and everything, but that kind of, when I thought about that and it had the all wheel drive, uh, it was a six speed. Um, I, uh, I, I bought that car and it was, uh, it was a wonderful car. I, I said, uh, I bought a set of Pirelli Soto Zeros uh, for it, winter tires, and I okay. put them on the turbo style wheels uh, for that at the time. I think they're five spoke, and there's the, the spokes are differentiated three each, I think. And 
uh, with slots. And yeah, it was just a wonderful car. It was a, a, a seal gray, I think was the exterior. seal gray is a nice color. I was going to yeah. say you're seeing yeah. it on the streets in Milan. It, it must've yeah. looked very wide that 4S in, in some of those streets in, in yeah. Milan when it's going yeah. around, that's for sure. Cause that's the yeah. one thing you notice in, uh, in Europe, the size of Porsches, they seem very, very big. They seem very, very wide. Yeah. I remember seeing yeah. a 992 in Porto a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, the first one I saw actually on the bridge there, and it was just, it just looked enormous. It looked so, so huge in, yeah. in, in that sort of uh, environment. So you bought the 997. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I'm a fan of the 997. I've been mm -hmm. in a Carrera 4S. A friend of mine in the UK, Nick, who's been on the first owner stories, yes. has a mm -hmm. black one, which mm -hmm. is a great car. Mm -hmm. I love it when you're sitting in the seat and you look through the rear vision mirror and you see those wide flanks, like you really yeah. know you're in a Porsche. I mean, yeah. as a first experience, it must, have been, uh, it must have been pretty amazing for you to, to drive that car the first time. It, it was. It was remarkable. Um, and uh, we took it uh, uh, to the mountains, which are uh, Bologna, about 45 minutes from Calgary, uh, the Rocky Mountains. And uh, some of the roads there are just amazing. Um, you got to keep your eye out for wildlife, but uh, it's just a spectacular driving area. And so I really enjoyed it there. But then I also started taking it to the track. And, oh, okay. and, that, and, and that's where you can really um, appreciate the engineering and the craftsmanship uh, and the design that goes into these vehicles. All right. So had you been to the track before that, Bob? Had you actually taken any t of your previous cars to the track? No, I hadn't. No. You hadn't. That was, it was my first time. Yeah. And when you bought the 997, it's a point one, right? What what year was that? Sorry, I, I missed. That was a 2006. 2006, and you purchased the car in? Uh, 2009. 2009. So it's a pretty yeah. new car. It's only three years old. Yes. Um the IMS thing would have been on the surface then. Was mm -hmm. that a concern for you when you purchased the car? Because it's something the listeners are always interested in about how you go about feeling comfortable with that issue. Yeah, it, it was. But, you know, uh, the research that I had seen was, you know, it had popped up, but it was the likelihood that it would with the vehicle that you own is, you know, is pretty slim. I wasn't sure. I know. I think it was the 2006, sometime during this 2006 production, I thought they had changed the size. Or Yes, that's the same as my 997. Yeah. It's got the larger bearing, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and and I, I wasn't certain. I didn't have enough uh, uh, intelligence, I guess, to figure out which one I had or, or, or search it down. But um, I just assume that, you know, yeah, it's likely remote. It wasn't big. I was so... It wasn't a big concern. I was so enthusiastic about the car that, and it was working well. I had it PPI'd before I purchased it. Okay. Um, and it was from a reputable dealer. The, the, the independent dealer in Calgary is, is still going strong now. And he's just got an incredible stable of automobiles and so great reputation. And uh, so, yeah, they were, you know, I, I wasn't too concerned. Right. Okay. That's good. So it's 2009. You buy this, uh, you buy the 997. Was it a, a you said you were worried about Porsche in the beginning due to maintenance and upkeep. Yeah. Was it a reasonably uh, inexpensive car to own? Was there anything major that happened during your ownership period? No, there was there was nothing major. Um, the The only item that ever um, uh, I had an issue with was a water pump, and and it had a leak on a water pump. And again, I kind of consider those consumables over time. Uh, everything mechanical wears out, and uh, by that time, I had taken it to the track several times. And so that's an awful lot of ex extra wear and tear on that particular vehicle, although they'll build for it. But, you know, I had it probably at the track six or seven times. Okay. So you, you're taking it to the track. Mm -hmm. Before you started taking to the track, and this is something that always comes into our minds, mm -hmm. were you worried about future value? Were you worried about that, you know, something might happen or when I sell no. it, I'm going to have to dis disclose this? Were you worried yeah. about that sort of thing? Uh, no, I wasn't. Um, I, I was, uh, you know, I, I recognize that, that that's going to have an impact. And I'm going to be honest with anyone um, that uh, that that would get the car. I would never hide anything. Um, and uh, uh, but the way that I look at it, and it's part of the reason why I daily drive my GT3, is they are they can be expensive. Um, um, and uh, but to get the real value out of it, to really enjoy it, um, you have to use it. And, yeah, and, good point. and at least from my perspective. And so the actual cost from my perspective, if, if, if I put 100,000 miles on my GT3 is the, at the end of the day, that's actually quite affordable. 
Yeah, I, I have to agree with you, Bob. I'm starting to think the same way, and I was probably on the other the other field, the other side, um, where I thought it was better to keep the miles down, not get too many miles on the car, keep the value. And I think because I have been overseas now for so long and my car's still in Australia, I think this is why I know when I go back, I'm going to do a lot of long trips, I'm going to drive it, I'm not going to worry about the miles or the kilometres anymore. Um, also, like like you said, I think it's better for the car. You know, it, yeah. It's better if you drive the car, and I think <clears throat> also... Really, how much how much are you going to lose on future value? Because I see cars even for Australia in Australia for sale with you know eighty thousand kilometers compared mm-hmm. to cars for fifty thousand kilometers, and really there's not a huge amount of difference, yeah. you know. So I think for the cost per mileage or the cost per kilometer, it's not that much that you're going to that you're going to lose. And then the enjoyment factor on that other side of it is worth it, isn't yeah. it? I mean, yeah. it's a balance. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So you've got I'm, a great car. Sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say I'm a little bit later in life, so things like that become very important. The value that you get out of something, the use that you get out of something, time is so precious. Um, and uh, so, so that's why I, uh, that's why, it, and Porsches, they're so much fun. Um, it just, you know, I drove it to work this morning and uh, I mean, I'm driving it now. And uh, <laughs> I, know, I, want to, I want to get into this very quickly because yeah. I'm very interested about this you di- yeah. daily driving your GT3. Yeah. So let's go on. So you've got the first 911. You're yeah. hooked now. That's it, right? You, you, hooked, decide, yeah. you decide, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to sell the 911, the, the Carrera 4, yeah. uh, the Carrera 4S. What, what do you look at next? What happens and how many years did you own it for? I owned it for four years and I was not planning on selling it. It's a wonderful car. And I regret like the 325 IS, I regret selling it. Um, I had that water pump issue on a Saturday morning. So I saw some water um, underneath the car uh, in the garage. And uh, so um, uh, I, I said, okay, that's an issue. So I, I my dad used to always, uh, whenever he saw fluid around vehicles, he's all, he would always taste it. So, <laughs> so I went there and tasted it. Really? And I said, okay, well, it's, yeah, exactly. It's just a little <laughs> bit, but he was a chemical engineer. And, okay. Uh, so, um, but anyway, so, uh, and, and uh, so it wasn't oil. So I thought, oh, that's okay. So I kind of thought it was the, you know, a, 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 a coolant leak of some sort. And the, dealership wasn't too far so I asked my wife I said darling can you follow me in 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 your vehicle and let's go to the dealership so we went to the dealership yeah it was the it was the water pump and um um, and they had uh, a a 991 Carrera 4 uh, uh, 991.1 Carrera 4 in the showroom so of course I'm looking at that my car is downstairs in the shop Right. Um, the dealer, the sales rep, uh, who's actually become a good friend of mine. Um, uh, and, uh, he comes over and starts talking to me, just a young kid who started with Porsche. Um, and, uh, I might've been the first car I bought from him, um, or his first sale. And, uh, so we, uh, uh, so he starts talking and of course it's brand new and it's shiny and everything like that. And it's got the sport design package. So the, uh, front, uh, air dam and, and, uh, and the rear wing, et cetera. Okay, and, nice. and yeah, it was nice. It was really specced out. So nice. brand new, brand new, brand new, brand okay. new. Well, it, it had 900 kilometers on it. The guy who ordered it, bought it. Right. And then, and then, uh, traded it in. And I think I know why I don't, it was the career of four. So I don't think he had, it had enough power for him if I had to guess. So long story short, um, I say, let me think about it. He makes me a good offer on my car, uh, a fair offer on my car. Um, that's a Saturday. On a Sunday, I text him and, and, and I say, nah, it's, 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 it's too rich for my blood. It's a wonderful vehicle, but it's too rich for my blood. And my wife was uh, at that time had on Sunday had to leave uh, travel. So so anyway, so we talked later that night and she says, what did you do? She said, you, you love that car. The, 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 you, lo- you, you love that new car when you saw it. I saw it. And, and so she said, you know what, if you really want it, um, yeah, text them back. And, and so I did. So my wife actually pushed so me into the it. 991. So, yeah. so a reasonably yeah. quick decision. So very quick. So yeah. what, Unexpected. What was the tell tell the listeners about the car? What was it was a nine nine one point one? It was nine it was nine nine one. And how was it optioned? Yeah, how was it? Optioned? Yeah, it, it was specked out uh, quite nicely. It had the two tone uh, gray and black interior, uh, heated seats, the comfort seats eighteen way, um, carbon throughout. Um, I had the sport design package. G, GT Silver had the I, I think they're the Sport Techno. 
uh, wheels. Yes, yes. I like um, those wheels, actually. They're they really are, nice wheels. They're the ones they're, with the silver sort of front. Yes, they? Yeah, they're yes. a great looking wheel on the 991. They really are. It was wonderful. Um, and uh, yellow dials, uh, yellow seat belts. Wow. Speed was speed yellow, I think. Uh, and and uh, um, and it was a great car. Um, it, it was PDK, and that okay. actually that actually was a little bit of an attraction because I had driven the driven the manuals, and I love manuals. Um, but PDK was new and everything, and I heard a lot of good things about it. And uh, so I thought, yeah, let's um, let's let's give that a sh- give that a shot. Yeah. Well, it's it's a very well optioned car. The person that bought it definitely had taste yeah. when they they yeah. spec'd it out because they didn't yeah. hold back at all, did they? No, um, no, they, yeah. So it's a Carrera four. You've come mm-hmm. out of the nine nine seven four S. How was the the feel of the car compared to the nine nine seven? You know, like how was how, what was the main difference that you noticed after a few drives? Um, I'd say um, maybe the front end turn in. Um, I think it was a little bit wider in the front end, and uh, um, I think it turned in just a little bit nicer, a little bit more crisp. Um, didn't notice it so much on the um, uh, on on the uh, on day to day driving, but on spirited driving, um, you could appreciate it. It was it was more hunkered down to the curves, I'd say. Um, and it was about the same level of road noise, obviously. And I think that's a function of just how the tires are so wide. Did you notice, uh, what about the performance wise? Did you notice any difference in the performance between it, the 997 and 991? It had pretty much the same engine. Um, it was 350 uh, horsepower. And uh, um, so, um, I, well, actually, I don't think, it, yeah, it was the same amount of horsepower. I think it was a 3.4 and my uh yeah. 997.1 was a 3.6 and so i actually think it had it felt like it had a little bit less right. um not a lot i only noticed that on the track on, on the straightaways on the track um but it did seem like it was down a few in you know um and i'm not sure is it heavier bob i can't remember if the nut is the yeah, it'll probably I'm be not slightly sh- heavier, right? I guess yeah, it, it, you never know with Porsche, right? Because there was more aluminum in that nine 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 one than the, the than the, the nine nine seven. Um, but uh, uh, I didn't. I certainly didn't notice the weight. But maybe that contributed to being a little bit less um, um, uh, a less less fast. At least it seemed to me less fast on the straight. But the PDK was wonderful, and and and, and with the way they um, developed it on the track whenever you really were driving enthusiastically it would and you change and, and changed it, it would just punch you know you'd get a yeah, punch in the yeah. back it was kind of a weird feeling the, the new ones don't do that i don't think but uh, it was it was it, 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 that would that would be that was a more than enough replacement for the engagement that you get with a manual <laughs> well i guess you are doing track days right because it, and the general consensus yeah. is that pdk is still better on the track you yeah. should have a PDK on the track. It's it's yeah. it's it's a better experience in most people's you know view, um, yeah. and it seems like it was for you as well. It was actually a better experience. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's um, you know I'm not the most skilled manual driver. I've driven manuals all my life, but to be really good on the track is a different story. The, you know, there's the, the there's the, once you learn the basics, you know, the balancing of the automobile is critically important in the corners. And, and that is a tricky thing to do. And uh, I just found I wasn't good enough um, to, um, to, to do that well. And, and the PDK is such a remarkable transmission. It's so well mated to their engines uh, and their automobiles that uh, I just find it flawless. And it allows me to, you know, on the track, it's, at least for me, is all about going fast. And it allows yeah. me to, to go fast. And I'm concentrating enough on looking ahead and and and, uh, and trying to be as smooth as possible um, and picking my lines um, and not being reckless to anyone around me. Um, that uh, that's enough work for me. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So with 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 the uh, 991. Um, and a comparison, because you know the listeners always like a comparison. The comparison between the nine nine one and the nine nine seven, running cost maintenance wise, were they both about the same? Were there any main issues or any issues that came up with yeah. the nine nine one? No, there wasn't. Um, the only issue that I had, and I had it for about four and a half years. So the only issue I had was um, I had um, 
I forget, they forget what they call the access entry where they, you just walk up oh, okay. to the car. The comfort access thing. The yeah. comfort access, exactly. And uh, on the driver's side door, um, sometimes that wouldn't work. So I just have to click the, the key fob and of course it would open, but it wouldn't open by itself when you, when you were in close proximity. And apparently the way that there, there was a wire behind one of the mechanical levers in the mechanism that was pinching it. And so it took them three or three times to get that fixed. Oh, right. So, but you know, that's trivial in reality. Yeah, and, yeah. and so, but nothing mechanically, it was bulletproof. It probably had, um, it probably had nine track days. And again, I'm driving these, I'm taking these, this is my daily car. I'm taking this to, to the office. I'm you know, taking it. Uh, I've had my wife, two dogs, yeah. ski gear in the car. Um, it's great. And, That's yeah, great. I mean, I'm using all of that vehicle. I mean, you know, like Porsche would love to hear that story. All right. So you, you're driving, you know, the second the second Porsche 911 you've owned. Uh, you've got the Carrera 4. You've got the 991. You're driving it daily. You know, this is becoming a bit of a trend here. You're driving it daily. You're using it on the track. You know, you know you're enjoying these cars. What happens to the 991? How long do you own that car for? And what do you start thinking about next? The um, I'm enjoying the 991. It's a wonderful automobile. Uh, and uh, uh, I have no plans on, on doing anything with it. Um, and uh, uh, then um, I see if you've, uh, I see the 991.1 uh, GT3 come out. Um, and I'm thinking, oh, geez, that, that, that would be pretty nice. Um, and, uh, uh, but I, um, you know, I, there's always something new, more new and shiny, um, or newer and shiny out there. And so I, I want to live within my means. And so, um, and I'm getting sort of all sorts of enjoyment out of the, out of the 991, um, C4. So, um, uh, but I'm always on the Porsche configurator just playing around and seeing the new products and everything. And then the 991.2 GT3 comes out and that seems to be a step above. Um, yeah. a, a, and uh, the new engine, um, not that the, the, the Gen 1 are anything <laughs> to sneeze at, they're wonderful automobiles, um, but certainly uh, everything seemed to resonate with me with the 991.2. And I'd always, you know, I'd, I'd have the dealership um, I did take my vehicle to the dealers all the time um, for uh, you know, changing the tires and uh, from winter to summer and that sort of thing. And so just the routine things. And I developed a relationship with them. You know, I, I, I did not buy many cars from them. So getting an allocation was going to be very difficult. Um, but I was fortunate enough to get one. And, and I think part of it was because I'm an enthusiast. I'd send them pictures from the track. I was uh, fortunate enough to go to Nurburgring and and I would uh, send them pictures oh, okay. of the the little uh, 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 Suzuki Swift that I drove over there. Okay. Uh, yeah, from and and uh, um, so that's how that's how I got into it. Before we get into the GT3, I just want to go back about the dealer experience, <clears throat> and I did talk about this on a previous um, podcast. What is it about for you about going to? directly to a Porsche dealer instead of a Porsche specialist? Is it because your car is under warranty or you just prefer the direct relationship with, with Porsche and with a Porsche dealer? It, it was, it was, it started off because the car was under warranty. Uh, but then when it was out of warranty, um, I, I think it was, it, it was just the, the, in, in the areas where I live, the specialists were not that less expensive. Okay. Um, and, and so it was, uh, it, 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 it was, it, it, and I did want to continue that. They, they work on the car. They've got the most updates from the manufacturer. And, and I just, for me, it, was, it, it, it wasn't that much more expensive. The uh, labor per hour was, was about the same. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Because in Australia, I mean, a lot of people use specialists because they are quite a lot cheaper to the, mm -hmm. to the Porsche dealer mm -hmm. um, for most things, not everything though, yeah. you know, most things, but not everything. So you, you decide that you want to buy a GT3, you want to buy the 991.2 GT3, which is mm -hmm. a fantastic car, whether it be in PDK or manual, they're both a fantastic car. Um, Porsche just made that that just that little bit better they fixed up the problems with the engine mm -hmm. you know they they tweaked a few things here and there as they always mm -hmm. do making us always want the newer model mm -hmm. 
from when you ordered the car, Bob, to when it was delivered, how long did you have to wait? You said you were lucky to get an allocation, and we all know now with the new GT3 as well, the 992 GT3, you know, the allocations are going to be impossible to get. So how, did, how long did you have to wait before the car was actually delivered? I got a call in September um, from the dealer and uh, and uh, from the sales the sales representative and uh, he because I had sent him in March or April I said hey if anyone ever comes available you know I'd be interested and of course it was si- radio silence but then in September uh, he called me and and I uh, and then mentioned that 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 I had an allocation if I wanted it and. Uh, I said yes, I want it, but just let me tech, check with my wife. <laughs> and uh, and because we're going course, up in value here, aren't we? We're going yes, up we, in yeah, value very yeah, quickly. Very quickly, and so, uh, but uh, you know, like the previous nine nine one, my wife was is wonderful and and was very supportive. So um, so I spec'd it out in. Um, um, I had like a two week window to spec it out. Um, so, um, it was like the end of say October, the first of, um, um, I think it was 2018, um, and, or 2000, 2017, I think. And, uh, so I spec'd it out, um, exactly what I wanted and, uh, it, it arrived, uh, in the middle of January, um, and I was able to, uh, to pick it up. Okay, that's quite good. So, how yeah. do you how do you control yourself? You know, you've got an allocation. Yeah. <laughs> you've yeah. got an allocation for a new GT three. It's like you know, heaven. Here we are. What? <laughs> how do you control yourself with the options? And what did you choose uh, mm-hmm. that would be suitable for the purpose that you wanted it for? Yes, and 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 remember, I'm gonna I'm gonna take this to the track, and but it's also my daily driver. Exactly. And that, yeah. And and that means twenty four. Uh, seven and 365 so all year round um and uh and and, that, and we have a real real canadian winter in calgary um so um i, w- I got it in launch color i got it in guards red i really like that um and uh um the, the biggest decisions i had were the carbon ceramic brakes the uh, uh the, the carbon bucket seats uh, the 918 seats and do i go pdk or do i go manual and so I spoke and, and, and you know, if uh, I kind of wanted the carbon ceramic brakes and I kind of wanted those uh, um, those carbon buckets just from the looks of them and everything, let alone their performance. Um, but they were very expensive options. Yes. And um, when I spoke with the dealer, they, you know, they asked they asked me, you know, what are you doing? Uh, what are you going to do with the car? And, and I told them, and they kind of knew what I had done with my previous automobiles, obviously. And so they said, well, you know, the, the, those, uh, the carbon seats will not be, may not be as comfortable for you in the way that you're going to be using it as it is for others. So you might want to go with uh, comfort seats. And so I got the 18 way comfort seats, which are actually heated, which is a good idea in cold yeah, climates. That's yeah, true. Um, and so, and, and, and it was, a, you know, it was less expensive. Um, and on the carbon ceramics, um, they said, if you're going to be tracking the car a lot, that, um, you know, steel rotors may be the way to go. Um, and I've heard different perspectives on this, mm, but mm. I, I did like the steel rotors. I did like, you know, in the research that I did, I think the, the cup two cars, uh, had steel rotors. And I think part of that might be there when they're changing the wheels, you know, you can break the carbon rotors. Uh, they're, they're not as robust as the steel if they get hit, but they're certainly robust for, you know, for irregularly loose. Yeah. So I ended up going, going with the carbon with, with rather the, uh, steel rotors, um, and the red calipers, uh, and then the and then the decision on the manual or the PDK, and the touring option came out on the Saturday, and the Sunday was when I had to have my spec into the dealer. Okay, and and so I did seriously consider the touring, um, the uh, but of course that only came with a manual. But I knew, hey, it's that engine. I, I'll be able to track that. It's more than my capability it'll take me years to get close to to exploring that car to its true capability and so uh, if ever and uh so i did seriously consider that as well and i show i configured two uh, the current version i have and then okay. uh, 
and and then the touring and i showed it to my wife and i said darling which one do you think right and, and she and she she went with the uh red with the wing so so that's what i got it was and and the final spec was the pdk and then i got carbon inside it and um it's it's a good i think it's a good spec so no reg- no regrets then no regrets not going nah. to the touring now no, no, not at all. I, and I know they've gone crazy. I just saw one on, I think it was uh, Bring a Trailer or, or yeah, something. Yeah, they have, yeah. You know, that where they've gone up in value like crazy. But again, with me, it's about what I use the car for and, and what I enjoy it. And I know, you know, 500 horsepower is a lot a of lot. horsepower with a manual. Yeah. If, yeah. In particularly on the track, if you're a good driver and that yes. and that's you know and can handle it that's fine uh, for me uh, just for me the pdk is the way to go it's matched so perfectly with that engine yeah. i agree with you actually I, I tend to think that even the 901.2 and a, lo- a lot of people say the manual is sublime the manual is perfect in the mm-hmm. 901.2 but i think with the power that you're getting now um, really maybe PDK is the better option. Do you know what I mean? Like the GT3 yeah. RS is in PDK for a reason. Mm-hmm. You know what yeah. I mean? The GT2 yeah. RS is in PDK for a yeah. reason. Yeah. The new GT3, I don't know whether you would spec the new 992 GT3 in, in manual. I think, you'd, I think you'd have to go PDK. I don't mm-hmm. know why I think you'd have to go PDK. The one thing that I'm interested with though is I understand the brakes because I mean, mm-hmm. I've heard that, I've read it and I've heard it about the steel brakes yeah. is still a better option if you're doing track days. Mm-hmm. Um, the lightweight buckets is always a confusing one, I think. And mm-hmm. I think if I was doing in your in your shoes and doing that that specification, I would struggle with the carbon buckets because in some ways I think I would rather have the carbon buckets mm-hmm. if I'm doing what you're doing with the track days. And yeah. also I remember on um, – I can't remember with the Spikes Car Radio or, or Smoking Tire where Andy Prudinger is on there and he said yeah. that the, the lightweight buckets in carbon – he finds them more comfortable than the comfort seats. And he yeah. says on a long, I think he said on a long drive he did, it was like 300 miles or whatever. And he said mm-hmm. he feels much more comfortable. Yeah. I don't know. It's, it's a tricky one, isn't it? I mean, do you think that you've lost anything on the track without having the support of, of the lightweight buckets? Uh, you definitely move around a lot more. There, there, there's, there's no question. Um, so, um, yeah, if I was, and when I've sat in them, and I've only sat in them for short periods of time, they've been fine. You know, a little bit tricky to get in and out of. Yes. Um, and uh, so I think that uh, that bolster on the driver's side door, you know, would have been scuffed up and everything. And um, but that that's okay. That's normal wear and tear. Um, and I think you can get stuff to protect it. But um, uh, yeah, I mean, if that's, um, I haven't missed it. I'm, you know, I'm not. I track a lot. But uh, but I'm you know I'm not a uh, I'm not yeah. a track junkie. <laughs> but the balance the so. balance for you is is Bob is the fact that you do daily drive it, and I yeah. think that's really really yeah. important. And you yeah. you know not necessarily compromise, but being sensible and 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 specking yeah. something that's going to be good for both. You know what I mean? You're not going to yeah. lose much out of either with with the uh, with the seats. Yeah. So it's a it's a, uh, so you got carpet inside, so it looks fantastic. So you bought this yeah. car in 2018. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. And how has it been? How, uh, how, I want to ask actually, how have the track days been? Like, do you feel they, now yeah. that you, you, your school level has gone up? Do you feel your confidence yeah. level has gone yeah. up? What's changed? Yeah, it's been, it's been a rock, remarkable. I've done 15 track days with it, um, in Alberta and in, uh, Texas and, uh, and a lot with the uh, Porsche, Porsche Club of America here, which is a wonderful organization. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and what I would say is, yeah, it was a, significant change from my previous automobile and i would say it's only been the last uh two or three track days where i've really started to exploit all the capability that that car has where i felt that my skill has reached a level where i can safely um um uh drive that car close to the edge you know it is my daily driver and 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 uh and so you do have to be careful um, and so you're not going to, for most of us, we're not going to the extreme edge, but I've gotten a lot more close to that and uh, really been able to exploit all the, it, it, as much as the capability matched to my, my capability, the car's capability matched to my capability as I can. Um, so, um, I mean, I'm still far from exploding at all, but I'm a heck of a lot closer to it than I was before. And it's just been amazing. It is just an amazing vehicle. 
That's fantastic, but it's a great lead up. You know, you've gone from the 997.1 yeah. C4S, mm-hmm. you've gone the 991 C4, now you're in the GT3, you know, a car that most Porsche enthusiasts want. You know, mm-hmm. if they haven't got one already, it's always on the wish list. Everyone I speak yeah. to, it's always a GT3 is somewhere there, whether it be a yeah. 996, 997, or a yeah. new 991 or a 992. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, how do you do it though? And I just want to remind the listeners, in fact, before I get onto that, I just want to tell the listeners your Instagram. Um, mm-hmm. It's at 991C4, correct? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So at nine nine one C four. So if you go to uh, Bob's Instagram, he's got images of his car on that Instagram, I'm sure. Um, yeah. And give him a follow when you're there, and tell him you heard his story on owner's stories. Um, what was I going to get onto? The tires. I'm interested to know with the tire situation. So you're going to the track. Do you have the cup twos on the car? You know, are you changing tires all the time? Like, how does that work? As and I just want to remind the listeners, this is your daily driver, as you said. And yeah. you said in your message to me, you've done 31,000 or 32,000 kilometers, correct? I don't know what yeah, that that's is. correct. In miles, yeah. that's about yeah. 25,000. Yeah, at 20,750 as of this morning. I just looked at it okay. before and I you, came in. And you've owned it for two years. Uh, three years. Three yeah. years. So that's yeah. that's yeah. that's a world-driven GT3. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I know the listeners are saying, how does it, how does it cope as a daily driver? Yeah. You know, pros and cons. Yeah. Um, and, and what about the tires? Let's start with the tires first. How sure. do you go with the tires between track and street and daily driving? How do you manage that? Yeah, I, the, I didn't do anything. I mean, that's that's what I love about this car. Um, it, you, you know, it's uh, I've got uh, I had a Michelin uh, Sport Cup uh, two tires on it. So I, I think I went through three uh, series of those um, and they were fine. I own, um, and then oddly enough, just last week, um, I ran over, uh, some nails, um, on, on the highway here, if you can oh, believe okay. that. Wow. And so I had to have, uh, I uh, had to have them repaired, replaced. And, uh, and so I was looking at the Michelin, uh, pilot sport for S yes. and, and the reason I went that is because, um, there is an awful lot of rain here in Houston and, uh, I've never had any issue with my vehicle. I've never, um, um, you know, you just drive for the condition. So you have to slow down and it's been, it's been perfectly fine, but, um, I had heard, uh, I think Chris Harris had, had, had put some on his, uh, um, touring and, and said they were remarkable. I heard that for some others. Yeah. So I've put those on my car now. And we'll see we'll see what that looks like on the track. I've heard that uh, they don't dissipate heat as well, um, so your twenty minute sessions on the track become more like fifteen. Okay. Um, we'll we'll find that out. I've got a, a track day coming up in a couple of months, and it'll be super hot down here. Um, so, uh, but the tires, you know, uh, on the track or on the road have, have been, have been fine. And of course, in the winter time, uh, when the vehicle is in Canada, the, um, uh, I, I put proper, uh, Pirelli Soto zeros on the car. Yeah. Okay. Be interesting to know what you think of the 4S to the cups, actually. Mm-hmm. The cup twos mm-hmm. would be interesting. I know Steve with his 997.1 GT3, he's mm-hmm. been... <clears throat> He's been to- toying with the idea of getting 4Ss. Mm-hmm. I know he's got a spare set of wheels in Vice mm-hmm. Gold and, he, and he's thinking about yeah. putting the 4S tires on, on those because he's running yeah. the Cup 2s in the street. Sydney yeah. does rain a bit in winter. It is a bit hairy yeah. on the road. So mm-hmm. um, it would be interesting to see what he thinks of them as well. Yeah. Um, I guess with track days, uh, track days, Bob, the, the most expensive cost would be the tires, right? It really yeah. is the tires yeah. that you go through. Yeah, um, that's right. So you've gone through about on the GT3, you've gone through what, three sets, you said? Three, three, three sets, yeah. And how many track days would you have done on those three sets on each set? Um, well, uh, track days on each set probably probably about probably about five. Yeah, probably about five. Okay. And I, and I, and, and I had I had, uh, but I also you know they're my daily. So it, and, 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 and while I'm not a, a hoonigan, I I, uh, I I I am spirited on the off ramps and things like that. So. Um, um, uh, but uh, but yeah, they you, you know they're certainly expensive. Um, um, but, um, but they've served us well. And I probably had, I would say I probably had another 5,000 miles left in my, uh, in, in the tires that, uh, I, I got five nails in. Um, so yeah. that's very unlucky getting five nails in your tires. Yeah. That's for sure. It yeah, almost it feels was, like someone done it on purpose, doesn't it? It almost feels like it's <laughs> Well, it, it, I was coming on an off-ramp and I saw this debris and I looked and the first thing that went through my mind is I said, oh, that looks like nails. And then 
but I thought it couldn't be nails. It couldn't be that many nails. I thought it was just small gravel or something. And um, so I checked my pressures afterwards. Things were fine. Um, and then the next morning they were down. Wow. And I went back to the location and it was on a curve. And I think um, a contractor, probably, there's lots of contractors with trailers here, open trailers. And I think they just, they just kind of were going around the corner, a pail of nails spilt over and because there were a lot of them and they're all now on the side of the road. So, yeah. Wow. So let's go back to the consumables, the brakes. Um, you chose the steel brakes and you chose yeah. the steel brakes over the carbon ceramics yeah. because carbon ceramics are obviously expensive to, to mm-hmm. replace mm-hmm. Um, the braking thing. Mm-hmm. How are the brakes so far to date and are they looking like you need to change them, the rotors soon or the pads soon? How are they looking? No, it, 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 they're, they're in great shape. When I, when I got my new tires a couple of weeks ago, of course they did the, 100 point inspection or whatever, whatever they call it. And uh, I, th- my uh, brake pads were still in the green zone. I think they were eight mils each left. Uh, um, okay. But, but I know, uh, yeah. And so, and I brake hard on the, on the track, you know, yeah. I'm, 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 I, I, I know it's mechanical, it's a mechanical piece of equipment. So I, you know, other than the track, I treat, treat it with a little bit of sympathy. So I'm, I, I don't brake hard on the street so much. Um, um, and, uh, unless I'm doing a little bit of spirited, but no, they've been, they've been fine. Absolutely. Have they been better than the previous cars on the track with the brakes? I'm just wondering about the, uh, yeah. and I'm sort of going off tangent here, but I'm wondering about the compound they use on GT3, what the brake pads are. I mean, I'm guessing they're a more high performance brake pad than, than usual. Yeah, I, I think they are. Um, there's certainly a little bit more squealing, but that, that, that to me, that's motorsport. So I love it. It doesn't bother me at all. And, uh, um, yeah, I'd say that they definitely have a bigger bite than uh, the Carrera Ford. And remember, the Carrera Ford had, you know, had had, had small brakes. Um, I still had the uh, on the on, on the Carrera Four S. It had the the big reds. Um, but uh, but yeah, the brakes, the technology has definitely moved on. So um, the GT3 maintenance. Let's go back onto maintenance. Let's just mm-hmm. go into the question that everyone mm-hmm. wants to know. Uh, and you've owned three three nine elevens now. Mm-hmm. How are the maintenance costs on a GT3? Is it what people expect where they think, I'm going to buy a GT3, it's going to cost me so much money every year? Has it been exorbitant? No, Has it been no, okay? It, it's, it's been absolutely fine. It's been it's been reasonable. It's just like another uh, 911, um, to be honest. You know, the most ex- the biggest expense and it's self-inflicted are the tires. Um, and... Uh, um, uh, but, but the other, the, you know, the oil changes, I had the major service last year. I think it, uh, I think it's around 15,000 miles or maybe it's two years, whatever comes first. But, but uh, regardless, I, I had that done, um, where they change out the spark plugs and do a few more things. Uh, and, and that was about $1,500. So it was a lot less expensive than I thought it was going to be. So, I mean, they're not inexpensive. You have to sacrifice other things um, to like, you know, there's always trade-offs in life. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it's, it, it has not been, I haven't noticed it more than my other cars. That's good to know. Good to know. So daily driven, let's go back to the weather let's go back to the weather yeah. in canada daily yeah. driven and you said yeah. in your message to yeah. me you know minus 27 degrees you daily drive this car yeah. on snow snow and ice roads yeah. now tell me how do you feel when you're driving this car on, on with that much power in the snow on these icy yeah. roads it must be a little bit hairy it must be a bit scary yeah you 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 definitely have to be be cautious and and uh, uh you know there's not many silver bullets in the world but when driving if you drive for the conditions if you slow down um you can you can do it safely um the uh but you have to, you you have to be careful um you, you know and uh um but i was it was amazing i was driving into the office in in calgary and i looked and it was one early morning and uh, it was still dark out and the temperature was minus 27.5. And I'm thinking, what a remarkable vehicle. It can operate at minus 27.5 and then also operate at plus yeah. 35, plus 38. And it's still the same. But I, you just slow down, make sure you have good snow tires. Obviously, it's a very low car. And so if you have a lot of snow on the road, then you probably shouldn't be driving it. You're going to run into issues because it'll pack up underneath. But from a traction perspective, um, it's it's remarkably um, um, well. It, it, I mean, why wouldn't it 
to have good traction so long as you've got good tires, right? It's a, yeah. it's a performance And it's car. so well balanced as well, isn't it? I mean, it and is it's well so, balanced. It, and it's so well balanced. So I never had any scary moments. Um, um, and, uh, and, and I, and I took it, as I say, I, I took it to, uh, um, took it to the office all the time to run errands, um, to go, to go, to go to the mountains. Um, and, and, and it, it, it was fine. There only one time, um, we have an alley in, in, in the back of our house where our garage is and it's not, the snow's not removed from that alley. So it piles up and gets thick. And I was coming home from work one day and uh in any in long story short i got stuck and so i had to call my wife at work there were no neighbors around <laughs> so i had to call my wife at work and ask her this darling can, can you come home and help me push the car out <laughs> i'm blocking the alley okay uh and and we got it out it just need to remove a little bit of snow so you've got to be careful i yeah. was i wasn't careful that no, time i think it's great i think anyone listening now who is scared of driving the 911 in the rain or scared of driving it in extreme yeah. temperatures i mean you just prove that it's possible you know the the range in temperatures you've driven your car you yeah. know and as you said you've got to be careful like anything can get twitchy in those conditions no matter yeah. what car you're driving it doesn't have to be yeah. a 911 does it yeah uh, and you could have got and you would have got stuck in that back lane of your house in in any car really in that sort of snow yeah exactly Unless you're in an suv or something yeah. so i think that's, that's right. fantastic so yeah. you said that you, you you we're almost getting to the to the hour but you said that you went to nurburgring mm-hmm. north schleifer and you drove the track in a what was it? I forgot the car. It was a, a Suzuki Swift. A, a Suzuki, a tri- Suzuki a tri- Swift. <laughs> yeah, tr- tricked out Suzuki Swift. It had semi slicks and roll cage and gutted out interior, but it was only 106, five speed, only 100, 136 horsepower. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> so, are you going to, after having that experience, mm-hmm. is there a plan in the future to go to Nordschleife, go to the ring and, and, and drive a, a more performance car on the track? Yeah. Yeah, there, there, there absolutely, absolutely is. I mean, for those who have, of us who have been fortunate enough to go there, it's a remarkable place. Uh, and uh, but you've got to be very careful. Everything that that you see and, and hear about it is accurate. Uh, it is completely unforgiving. And uh, but if you drive it safely and under control, um, uh, you could do it well. Um, and so, yeah, I'd like to. There's a couple of spots that rent uh, 911s. Okay. And 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 I think I I just get. Um, I, 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 you know, I wouldn't get, I don't think I'd get a GT3. I think number one, they would be, they're pre, if they're rented, they're pretty expensive. Um, but, uh, I think I would just get a, a base 911, uh, Carrera S or something like that. And, uh, and, and, and see what that's like. Cause I'm pretty familiar with those vehicles now yeah. having, having, having driven them, but if they were unavailable and all I could get was that Suzuki Swift, I'd do it. Cause it that's was a just a great experience. Was I was just, just huge... I was just thinking actually, when you say renting, you know, Porsche have that thing in, in Germany where you can pick up the car from Stuttgart from the museum or the factory, yeah. you know, and you can have a car yeah. for a few days yeah. and I know you have to book well in advance. Yeah. I wonder if there's any conditions on that when you take that car from the factory. If you take it for three days, you could take it to the ring. I wonder if they have any conditions on those rentals because that would be a, you know, because you've got the selection of cars there. That'd be a great thing to do as well. Oh, it'd be wonderful. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. So the thing we always like to finish on is, you know, everyone likes to know if, if they come to uh, Texas, if they come to Houston, mm-hmm. or if they go to uh, Alberta, if they go to Canada, what is one of your favorite roads? What roads would you say, you know, take your 911 on this road, take your sports car on this road? What are your, some, what is your, your favorite road out of, out of the places where you live? Um, if, if you're in Calgary, um, if you go to the mountains, um, there's a highway called 1A out of Calgary, um, and it gets you to Canmore, um, which is the first Alpine village in the mountains. That's a wonderful uh, road. Uh, the first section is straight, but uh, then it starts winding through uh, the mountains and uh, the views are spectacular and the curves are challenging. Um, there's no shoulder. Um, so it's a wonderful road and you got to keep your eyes up because there can be animals on it. But it, it's just a wonderful road to drive uh, with a little bit of spirit. Great. Um, and then the other one up there as well is between Banff and Lake Louise. And that's just another 20 minutes from Canmore. Um, and uh, it's called the Banff um, Lake Louise Parkway, and uh, it runs parallel to the main highway, and that is just unbelievable. Again, it's another twisty uh, mountain road, 
Um, it's not like the Norse uh, but it's, uh, it's, it's, it's pretty close. Again, you've got to be careful because there's a lot of wildlife and, uh, but, um, you can, you can still have a lot of fun. And then down in Texas in the hill country in, in, in Austin, which is about, um, an hour, well, actually about two and a half hours, <clears throat> excuse me, from here. Um, there are some great, uh, uh, great roads in that area um that uh, again are you're driving in hills and sweeping turns uh lots of change in elevation um just some remarkable uh and i've been on four of them and i unfortunately i forget the name of the the the, the roads but they're easy to find um on uh you, you can just google them um and uh, and and they're just incredible driving roads um to, to really have fun in these cars fantastic what about your track of choice uh, my, my track of choice so far is uh, MSR uh, here in, in, in Houston. Houston, okay. um, Yeah, MS, uh, uh, Motorsports Ranch. Um, it's, uh, I think it's about two and a half, kilom- or two and a half miles long, and it's, it's got everything. It's got some twisties, it's got chicanes, it's got some big sweeping corners. It's, it's, it's a lot of fun. Of course, the, you know, the, 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 the Nordschleifel in, in yeah. Germany is, and I, and I know I'm ruining that. Because you've had but, the taste of it. So you want to, that's why you've had that taste, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, and also but, being a track guy, you know, you want to go back, yeah. don't you? Yeah, ab- ab- absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, yeah. All right, Bob, we're almost at the end. Um, mm-hmm. Is there anything else you'd like to share with the listeners before we leave? The only thing I'd mention is just enjoy your vehicle. You know, it, we're, we're all fortunate enough to be part of this community and, uh, uh, and it's just wonderful. And uh, and to to thank to th- thank you, Michael, the work you're doing to broaden that community, to bring us all together with these wonderful vehicles uh, and experiences, um, is is really special. So I just just thank you. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. Um, I really enjoyed your story. I knew I was going to because it's just you know as soon as you said daily driven, you know, USA, Canada. GT3, the new GT3. I mean, I think you are, you know, this is, uh, people should listen to this podcast and think, you know, if you're sitting your 911 in the garage and you're just waxing it, you're polishing mm-hmm. it, you're not driving it enough, mm-hmm. listen to, the, after you listen to your story, Bob, I think people are going to mm-hmm. change. They have to change. I mean, it's a great story. Um, and the more and more people I talk to, and I've never done track days, and the more and more people mm-hmm. I talk to who have done track days on these owner mm-hmm. stories, it just makes me think that I, I really do need to start doing a couple of track days and enjoying the car in, in that in that way as well, not just yeah. on the road. Um, because I think it would be, even even a base Carrera like mine, it would still be fantastic. Absolutely. It'd be, it'd be wonderful. It's a great way. And don't be intimidated. All of us, you know, we, we have a first day in everything. And the, the good track days, uh, they're very safe. It's really a team sport. We don't think of it that, but you're, you're really careful with your yeah, other yeah. Uh, drivers. Yeah, fantastic. All right. Thank you, Bob. Thank you so much for being on Owner Stories. Yep, you're very welcome. Thanks for having me. All right, everyone. That was uh, Bob coming in from uh, Texas, actually. He's in Texas today. Um, and Bob, you make sure you give him a follow on his Instagram. His Instagram is at 991C4, at 991C4. So go over and, and follow Bob and say hello and, her- and tell him you've heard his story. Um, and that's it for today. Thanks for listening. Bye for now. Bye for now.